it's a decade since we promulgated the constitution of Kenya. How would you characterize um, its, its implementation and the performance 10 years later? That is a constitution that embodies the aspirations of, of, of Kenyans. And of course you can have a constitution that is, that is paper. For it uh, to benefit Kenyans, it needs to be implemented. So 10 years down the line, I would say we have made some progress, uh, but much more needs to be done. Maybe if you are to rate this constitution, the, the implementation so far, on a scale of 0 to 10, 0 being our implementation, how we are performing with it right now is bogus, and 10 being the ideal. 10 years on, what is your rating of this? I think I would put it at um, between 5 and 6. On the day that it was promulgated, that's on the 27th of August 2010, where were you and what was your vision for Kenya from that point, which was such a significant point for our country? I was at Uhuru Park and uh, people were optimistic. All of us were happy. It was a very, very happy moment. Uh, the only sad thing is uh, over-enthusiastic people threw mud at the former late president. It went past me going there. We, we don't need to have done that. I think he played his role, but um, it was a, a, a joyous uh, moment for, for Kenya. Do you feel that enough has been done to ensure that Wanjiko gets the justice that she deserves? I think the constitution basically opens up a lot of spaces, all right? Uh, the judiciary in, in, in included, but then of course it also, the spaces have to, uh, to, to there, there have to be policies, there have to be implementation issues around it. Uh, so to the extent that uh, we have an expanded judiciary uh, with courts all over the, the country, in areas which never had courts, uh, most Kenyans could not access institutions of justice. Uh, we have um, uh, appointed more judges and more magistrates. So in, to, to, to that extent, I think um, there is uh, opportunity for Kenyans to realize justice. And what about the constitution's performance in ensuring the rule of law? is upheld? If you just look at it as a constitution, it, it has what it takes for this country to realize the rule of law and respect uh, the human rights of Kenyans and provide for Kenyans in, in, in a better manner that, uh, than we are doing. So on paper it's, it's, it's in your view ideal? Yes. So, but on the ground, it's a different situation because we find that uh, human rights have been abused. We are seeing a lot of uh, abuse of law, even from the highest offices of the land. So where is the disconnect? What is the challenge? What is making us not live up to this ideal? It is human beings who implement the constitution. So we are having human beings who are not respecting the constitution and therefore uh, they, they, they breach uh, the provisions of the law or they do things contrary to, to, to what the constitution would require them. So that, for example, if, um, if courts make decisions, it is the business of everybody and in a, a society where there is rule of law to obey uh, the, the, the decisions of the court. Because if we don't, then we walk ourselves into a situation of anarchy, all right? So it's not the constitution, it's the people. That again now is good on paper, you know? So what is the recourse, so to speak, of Wanjiko, who, whose taxes are going to finance all this and whose taxes are paying the people in power, for instance, when we have, say, the executive disobeying court orders? What then? Or are we just stuck in a situation where, because there have been a, the accusation that it has been a case of mutadu kind of, you know, approach? 
which is an, 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 an unfortunate situation because if we want a country or where rule of law um, uh, is, is the norm, then we have to obey court orders. If we are unhappy with a certain court order, then there, there is the, 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 the appellate process. And it is only the court which can stand for everybody, for the Wanjiku, for the big ones, for the small ones. And if we disregard the court, then certainly we are walking down a, a, a path of, of, of anarchy. There's a current situation where the judiciary wants the president to, to swear in 41 judges and the, the executive has refused um, to do as much, claiming that there are some who they need to, who are not being cleared in terms of corruption and the likes. What does the constitution provide for in terms of such a situation where there's a sort of deadlock, which at the end of it, the ripple effect is that the process of justice for you and I is being slowed down. As to whether the Judicial Service Commission is doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing uh, is another question. But they have the constitutional power and the mandate of the Kenyan people through the constitution to appoint judges. And once they have appointed, uh, the duty that uh, the executive is left with is to, to swear them in. On one end, the, the judiciary would say that this is what the constitution says. The president says there are some of your, the officers among the 41 who have got, uh, they have got questions about their integrity. So how does that deadlock get unlocked? Because just this being an example of many other situations that would be like this. If we are to remain faithful to the Constitution, you, you swear them in, then probably commence a process of their removal. Wouldn't that be a bit um, self-defeating being after the fact? What, what of swearing in, hypothetically, 30 who you feel are clean and leaving the 11 out? Uh, then you, 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 you will be contravening the Constitution. I understand, but I don't know. I don't know what evidence there is. I don't know if the Judicial Service Commission uh, did not see the evidence, because then that, that is at the stage where they needed to have knocked out unsuitable fellows. Do you feel that we are actually at a place where there is um, proper and you know, ideal implementation of the separation of powers principle? Now, separation of powers does not mean that uh, each, each, each arm of government is completely independent of the other. There, is, there are areas of interface. I think there is a breakdown of communication. And being independent doesn't mean you don't communicate. We've also seen, for instance, um, the executive and parliament Parliament has been accused of just being a rubber stamp for what the executive wants. Uh, such a situation is also unfortunate. So where you have such a situation where Parliament feels emasculated, you, you, you are then taking us backwards to the days that we ran away from before the, 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 the Constitution. The 2013 ele presidential election and the 2017 one where the courts were brought in um, to, to kind of help resolve the, the situation that was at hand. What did you say the court's role in resolving disputes meant for the rule of law in the country? The judgment should be respected. That's what we call the rule of law. It doesn't matter how, what you feel about that judgment. If we are to live within uh, the rule of law and we respect our democratic principles, uh, separation of powers, then we, we, must, we must obey because the courts have ruled. Just think about, you know, court, obeying the courts. You're very passionate about it, even as you explain yourself. I'm sure you know about the saga of <clears throat> Miguna Miguna being deported and the government has been accused of, you know, disobeying court orders. What do you make of that whole situation? We must respect the court judgments. So where we, because of how we feel about the judgment or the recipient of the judgment, 
uh, and then we, we disobey, that is not respecting the rule of law. That is not creating an environment where the rule of law will, 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 will flourish. The executive, for instance, um, going against court rulings, um, or break, you know, breaching court orders, are we helpless? Because it's been out there, this has been done against the law, but nothing happens. It, it, it is a, a dangerous situation we, we, we are getting ourselves into. Because supposing everybody decides to disobey the court, uh, the judgments of the court, what will happen? Anarchy. What will happen? For me, it's, a, it's unfortunate because then we, we, we are in this situation uh, where we are in limbo uh, because uh, court judgments cannot be, be obeyed and the, and the courts still remain the arbiters of our dispute. And so we are caught up in a, not a very, very um, good situation. The court will order something the executive will disobey it, but the people who are meant to implement any orders against the executive are under the executive. That is the police, for instance. That's the quagmire we find ourselves in. Yes, that's a quagmire. And if we really respect our constitution, and this constitution is good, if we respect it and we play our, our, our role, I think it, 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 it can guarantee us the rule of law. So where people can't implement because they, 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 they find their hands tied, it, it, it is unfortunate. I tell you, then we are not walking the right path. Now, as a woman leader, uh, what do you make of the failed attempts to pass the two-third gender rule by parliament? The constitution is self-executing in that regard, in the sense that it says if if, if Parliament fails to put in place legislation for realization of certain provisions of that constitution, it can be dissolved. So I don't know why nobody has moved to dissolve Parliament. Realization of the one-third gender rule is a constitutional requirement. You are not doing anybody a favor. You are not doing women a favor. The Constitution says, as a form of affirmative action, you need to implement the not more than two-thirds gender. But the debates are like, oh, those women want free things. What? They, they don't want free things. The debates of wanting free things passed. This is a constitutional principle. And why do we need parity of men and women in, in, in public space, in, in parliament, for example? It's because that is a place where decision-making is made. Serious policy decisions are made in Parliament. And it is appreciated that men bring in a certain value system. And the women bring in a certain value system. So that if you have these two voices balancing, then you will get a uh, very balanced um, uh, decision, policy decision making. They bring in value systems which are diverse. And if combined, then uh, we will have balanced decision making. Could this be that Kenyans are not ready for more women in leadership? I, I, I don't know. Maybe they don't understand why women should get into leadership. But a balanced participation of both genders is, is important, it's good for our development. Some people have proposed that we should scrap the office of the woman representative. Now that is a very misunderstood office. Eh? It is also part of affirmative action. But I've seen men arguing that uh, they, they should also have a, a men's uh, rape. No, no. You can't have a men's rep because you don't need affirmative action. You don't start from a disadvantage. So it is a form of affirmative action. 
uh, the 47 was again to add to numbers of women as we strive towards at least one, one third gender um, uh, realization of that uh, requirement. So it is affirmative action. Uh, don't scrap it. And if you scrap it, make sure you have another one which brings in women so that we, we, we get to a level of, 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 of parity. So what if we go to the polls in 2022 and Kenyans do not vote in as many women? The, the constitution encourages participation. Okay? And where, for one reason or the other, affirmative action provisions um, are meant to cure that. And if, if we look at the devolved governments, uh, the, 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 the provision in the constitution on the devolved government is clear. That's why we don't have a problem there. But it wasn't clear uh, on the National Assembly and, 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 and Senate. But uh, should we reach a stage where women are not voted in, uh, we, we must strive to have measures uh, that bring in women. And I have told you, gender parity is good for development. It's not good for the women. It's good for development. Is it that the constitution does not then provide for a situation where the electorate does not vote in as many women? or as many people from a certain gender, where we have, say, a 90-10 situation. The, the Constitution does not provide for that? Uh, it, or did it assume that that cannot happen? It, 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 uh, it provides for fair competition. Okay? Those women who can compete and, and, and make it to Parliament, that is, that is fine. But where there is that shortfall, that is where we have the affirmative action provisions through the not more than one third gender rule and then the provision for, for the women reps, okay? Which is still not bringing in as many women as possible. So, so there again, we are not meeting that requirement. And the women who hold it in parliament, do you think they also have a part to play in the failure of the passing of the two third gender rule? Because you've mentioned the men but there are also women who are meant to have taken part in this process. Do you feel some of them are, quote, sellouts? Uh, I follow what they do and uh, they try. They have tried to, 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 to see if Parliament can pass the legislation. Although at some stage I was a bit disappointed because then they were like... Uh, what did they do? Like, um, like uh, buying uh, dinner for the men or something, you know, something to pamper them so that they pass the constitution. I, I, I think I was a bit uh, disappointed there. I think these uh, people should be made to understand the advantage of, of gender parity and also the constitutional requirements for, for this country. But um, overall, I think they try, but they are overwhelmed. I guess they are overwhelmed. Maybe a few have absented themselves at critical moments, which is unfortunate, because they have all gone there because they have ridden on, on the shoulders of women. So they, they should ensure that uh, the, the, the principle is realized the legislation for the realization of the principle is put in place. Okay, and let's talk about land a bit. Uh, would you say we have achieved what the constitution envisaged in regards to the land question? I wonder what have we done so far on the land question? But uh, as of now, I don't think we have touched it. There is a lot of inequality and inequity in land ownership in this country. And we haven't had the courage to face it. And I was just telling you, even as uh, for women, where they say uh, a, a girl can inherit from her parents, nobody is giving them. And the brothers would rather kill her than, than give her part of it. So we have the constitution. 
And there was actually a landmark ruling, you know, about women being able allowed to inherit yes. family property. Yes, yes, yes. There are very progressive judgments from the court. Very progressive. But uh, few are giving, but the rest, no. So we are saying that a lot of the country, depending on the interests, is, you know, relegating court rulings and orders to just you know, pronouncements on paper. Mm, paper pronouncements, yeah, which is unfortunate. Uh, we should be in a situation where we respect the court judgment and implement the decisions of the court. So that where it has said a girl must inherit 50%, we implement that judgment and give the girl 50% of her father's land, whether she's married or not. That's what the law says, yeah? But uh, I think because of our historical deprivation, we look at land like, uh, I don't know, we would rather kill than seed any of it. You know, people hold so much land in this country, so many acres, and it is just somewhere there. They do nothing with it. And you look at these Kenyans, and you see them every day. You people on the TV bring us these sad stories. If I were, if I ran this country, I would start from there. Let everybody, every Kenyan, have a place to live. I think we cannot, we cannot afford to see People carrying their beds and in the rain going, and they don't know where they are going. And they are carrying children. And it is year in, year out. And people are sitting on 4,000 acres. Don't we have a conscience as a country? Don't we have a conscience? Okay? I would start from there, but I guess it's a difficult question in this country. But I would start from there. No Kenyan should walk like that. You don't know where you are going. Then, then, then they send fellows there to cool you down. Then so you go back. Then the following year we see you again carrying the kitanda and going. What are we doing to Kenyans? And let me tell you about this constitution. It is both a legal and a moral document. It is a legal as well as a moral document. Moral in the sense that it needed us to do a lot of introspection, questioning ourselves, all right? Are we doing the right thing? Am I treating my neighbor better? And if we thought that way, then there would be no reason to have squatters. There would be no reason to have landless people. There is no reason why we have people sitting on top of each other in, in Mathare and wherever. Everybody in this country can have something, right? If we introspected as policymakers, we would drive a reasonable car for government. This is a small country with a small economy. Why do we have huge cars, three of them for one person? gasoline the oil, you know? And, and that needs serious introspection. And by the way, if we did that, there is so much that can go around. And COVID has just revealed how unequal we are. What, what are people eating? You people, what are people in Kibera eating? In Gorogojo, what are they eating? Okay? So it, it, it is a moral document. And I keep saying that um, we put new wine in old wineskins. It, it, it creates very socialist expectations of, of, of our government. But uh, we continued like nothing had changed. So you're saying people's self-interests are greater than, you know, than yeah. being their brother's keeper? Yes. We, few Kenyans are their brother's keeper. Everybody is selfish. Everybody wants land. Even in this COVID where we all know you could be here today and be dead tomorrow, but we are still stealing. 
See, I heard from you people in nation that uh, COVID money has been stolen. Did you hear? Me, I heard that people in power have actually stolen COVID money. Where are you taking the money in this COVID where you could be dead tomorrow? Okay? Now, what, what kind of people are we when you can even steal that COVID money? You, you go around the country much as we are saying, uh, you, 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 we, we, must, uh, uh, we must wear masks. We must. People can't afford a mask. They can't. And you, you have taken, was it 200 and or something billion? Some small girl has uh, been awarded. Eh? Th that man, you see, now, that is where the immorality comes in. Everybody wants to be a billionaire without working for it. Everybody wants to snatch the next piece of land to add on what he already has. To speak of the selflessness that you, know, you feel that would be a result of that introspection. You know, you're saying, why would a uh, government official need three big cars, three big guzzlers? Uh, why would you need all this? When you were in office, did you refuse some of these things? Fortunately or unfortunately for me, I was there for hardly six months. It wasn't long, you remember. And uh, I wasn't in a, uh, I had insight there, but uh, you no know, th things go through your mind. Yeah, because I had just come out of the constitution making process, and we went around the country. We went to all the villages. We saw the poverty levels, levels of deprivation. All right. Uh, these huge cars, really. Huh? But you enter a government and uh, those, that is what you get. And then they tint them. Eh? So you sit inside, you never get to see your surroundings. You don't see these people. That's government for you. So you're saying you did not do that. I mean, you didn't have, is it that you didn't have enough time or you are still surprised at how I'm much opulence. I'm still tr trying to understand this uh, kind of good life, you know. Such very good life, you know. Maybe I would have uh, loved it and uh, stayed in it, but uh, I think w we need to introspect. That's what I'm saying. And when you think about um, the calls there have been of late and they've been increasing, they were slowed down a bit by the heat of the pandemic, but they're still there. Change of constitution. The head of state was quite clear on it, giving it context from history when he was giving his Madaraka Day speech. That, you know, we are, we, we are at a time where the country is ripe for a change in constitution. Do you agree? The constitutional moment for this country came with a 2010 constitution. There is no constitutional moment now. And the constitutional moment is a very, uh, a very uh, powerful constitutional term. All right? It has its parameters. The constitutional moment came in 2010. Let's implement that constitution. We don't have a constitutional moment here. We don't. Which one is it? We need a few things here and there. And from where I sit, we have hardly implemented the Constitution. We need to implement it. We don't, in some instances, we don't need to change it. All right? But where they are saying, um, is it a system of government? You know, that has always been a contentious issue. We were in it up to Bomas. And the Kenyans stood there and said, we want a parliamentary system of government. It was in that Katiba. It is nothing new. Who changed it? You know, the politicians took that document, went to Naivasha, and they removed it. They all agreed to remove it and take us back to the presidential system. Now, is that the constitutional moment now? 
The same, same fellows who removed. Is it the constitutional moment? But should we need to change it? And if it, it strengthens our democracy, uh, then, uh, then we can do it. But uh, most of these other things, really, that constitution is good. Let, let's implement it. So but a constitutional moment, I'm a constitutional lawyer and a constitutional lecturer. It passed in 2010. So what do you think is the drive behind these calls for a new constitution or a change of constitution? Uh, I have looked at BBI. I'm not seeing like there are many things that need the constitutional change. Probably system of government, which if it makes us better, let's, let's, let's be done with it. Otherwise, you look at all those things, they are mostly implementation of things, policy issues. Yeah, policy issues. So are we saying the government, at least because we've seen the president say that we're in a constitutional moment, are we saying the government is pushing to change a document it has been unable to implement, or ha in some, ex some instances refused to implement? We, we, we haven't implemented the entire constitution. And if we did, we would have very few problems. Okay? So there is this nagging problem of system of government. Would that help us uh, solve our perennial problems? Fine, let's deal with it. What else do you need? If you are talking about equity and equality and non-discrimination, they are all in the Constitution. Fair access to, to resources, it is in the Constitution. Chapter 6 he said uh, corrupt people should not hold office, it is in the Constitution. So what else are you looking for? Just implement that one. So it seems like you know, their interests are not being favored by the Constitution as is. I don't know what their interests are, I, I don't know. But what I'm saying, the sticking point is the system of government. And it has always been contentious. If they can sort it out, uh, for me I have no issue. But these other things of, uh, the, what are they talking about? Marginalization, we should share things equally. W what is not in that constitution? It is there. What about the current impasse on the revenue sharing? Again, uh, it, 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 we, we have failed to reason together. They should reason together. Have, have you seen them on TV? Are those people you can put together and say they can uh, talk and arrive at a consensus? Okay? Some things are give and take, some things, but I think if we, we listened to each other, uh, I think we, we could do better. And when you look ahead um, to the next 10 years, what, do you, what future do you see for Kenya and the Constitution? I think in the next 10 years, this country should go far. And devolution, if we made it work, is the best thing that uh, has happened to, to some of the, 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 the counties. I went, during the constitution making process, we, we went to places where they, they don't know they are part of Kenya. I went to a place called Ileret. It is in North Hall constituency on the border with Ethiopia. I have never, I have never been so shocked. You know, people who have nothing to eat, almost naked, no food. The only school they had was a school built by colonialists and it, it reaches class four. So if you go to school, you reach class four and beyond there, there is no no beyond, all right? They have never seen a doctor in their lives. They have um, a, a dispensary, and the clinical officer had died two years ago. So they have no, no clinical officer, nobody to treat them. So they just die. When you talk about heart trenching, what, what went through your mind? What were you feeling when you went and saw such situations, such circumstances? Oh, well, let me tell you, that's why when we sat down to craft the Constitution, we crafted it the way it is. The Bill of Rights, you know, right to health, right to education, right to food, right to water, 
right to shelter. We didn't pick these things. Some people commented, oh, these people were cut and pasted South Africa. No, we saw, we saw. And when we sat down, we, we crafted. And the devolution, in our minds, devolution was going to sort out uh, the issues of marginalization. If you were to rate devolution, as you see it now, between when it came into force and now, on again a scale of 0 to 10, 0 being bogus, 10 being excellent. What would you say our rating is? Uh, in the circumstances where they struggle for resources, genuinely for some, I would give 7. So some have done well, some are struggling, but we could do better. And uh, what I hear in most of them is the issue of corruption. It's like corruption was uh, devolved also, we, which we must get rid of so that uh, the money, the resources that go to the counties are used for the benefit of the people. Once we take care of corruption and nepotism, you know, people employing five of their sisters and aunties in one government, that is happening and that, and that, that is bad. All right? Let every Kenyan have an opportunity. You said, you'd mentioned, you know, you are the DCJ for a few months. And so what have you been up to since you left public service? I'm still in public service. I teach. Okay. I teach at uh, the School of Law, University of Nairobi. So I continued. I nurture the young people, young lawyers. So I'm still serving Kenyans, although not with the opulence. We, we make do with a small salary, but we, we, we are uh, serving Kenyans. That's what I do. And do you think Kenyans will ever see you in public service at the limelight level again? I don't know, but I like what I'm doing. I think I'm doing a good job where I am. You don't think teaching is uh, It's actually something. one of the most noble professions, I must Let say. Let me tell you, I have held positions. Before reaching the top, this is the best that I have had. It is. It doesn't have money, but in terms of fulfillment, I think it, it is the best for me. I, I love it. But if I go for a top job one day, I'll go for the topest job. All right? So that uh, I bring equity in this country. Is that Completely shake up the system. Is that just a statement or are you serious about it? I would think about it. God willing, if, I, if ever I did, I would shake up things around. What would be your top three things to do? Top three things. Focus on Kenyans. Focus on how we manage and distribute our resources. What are you driving? How are you owning this and that? Those would be my questions. How are the ordinary Wanjikus living? I feel bad when I see people walking in the rain with children on their back because they, they have been uh, evicted. And when you evict them, where are they going? Have you asked yourself, you are, this is a fellow who has been here for 20 years, <laughs> and you wake up and say, you have evicted. When you left office, it was under a circumstance that, you know, was not the ideal. Um, where you had the incident at a shopping mall. Given a chance, would you do things different? It, 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 that wasn't the way I do things. All right? Just something, a mishap happened. All right? It's not the way I do things. If you look at my history, I, I think I have spent my entire life really like uh, struggling for the less, <laughs> for, the, uh, for people who are of law or whatever. So this narrative that I'm arrogant and I whatever, it, it, it's not me. If you look at my history, all right? That was unfortunate, uh, and it, it, it did happen. It cost me my job, it, 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 it isn't the best. But that is not me, yeah.
I care about lesser people. Did you ever reach out to the lady? <sighs> the lady, the lady, I will, I, we've spoken once in our, maybe once, but I, I intend to look for her. So we sit down and just find out um, how she's doing. Yeah. But I, my nature, my history, look at FIDA, look at constitution making. I have never lived for Nancy. I have lived for the less advantaged people. Do you feel that women are held to a higher standard than men? Like for instance, do you feel if it was a man, the outcome would have been different? Men escape with murder. They get away with murder, literally, in this country. But a woman, oh no. So if it was Mwangi who had done that, what do you think would have been the outcome? Of course, the people would have laughed it off and, and, and Mwangi would be holding his job. We see, we see people doing bad things every day. What happens? Nothing. So how do we remedy that? You see, when a system is unfair, all right? And in so many respects, whether it is in sharing of property, whether it is in treating other people, where we are saying there is systemic inequality, then it permeates everywhere. There is inequality everywhere. Yeah. Do you think this kind of treatment where you're saying women are held to a higher standard, unfairly so, according to what you say, and men get away with murder, do you think this discourages women from pursuing leadership positions? Yes, it does. It does. Um, for example, when I went for my interview for Deputy Chief Justice, I don't know if you watched, I was dragged through hell. Okay, I'm a divorcee. So what has that got to do with, with you holding a position? But I was dragged through those, you know, things I studied, I did my PhD on um, gay rights. That's, that's intellectual work. It's research. But it became part of my bashing. All right? And then uh, really exposing your family to horrible ridicule. It, it, most women said if, if getting a position in government means going through that, then we are not going to apply. And let me tell you, these jobs get advertised, but competent people don't apply. They don't. I know real competent people, they just said, no, we wouldn't. Then something happens and see what you go through. Do you want to go through that? Where people don't care whether you have children or not, they don't care. So people, it, it discourages people. And I know many competent women who would rather just you live your quiet life. So if, get say, there. if say today you are appointed, um, let's say you're told to, that you're the Deputy Chief Justice of Kenya, would you take up the job? No. Why? Um, I, I struggled so hard to get that job, okay? I don't want to be given anything. I have never been given anything. I have always put my best foot forward. And whatever job I have held, you look at my record, I have produced, yeah? So that's a job I wanted to do. It, it went. I wouldn't apply for it again. And of course the constitution doesn't allow anybody to favor me by, uh, by appointing me. So I would not apply for it. And I have told you the only job that I'll go for will be the presidency. If one day I decide to go for a public job. Because this, we have to revolutionize things around here. So, for instance, 2022, and there is a new president, the Republic of Kenya, and he or she is putting together their cabinet. 
and says based on like you've said your record which you which you've you know said is a is a strong one appoints you to become our cabinet secretary um, for legal affairs maybe the attorney general would you take up the job no why it's not been given to you because it's been done on merit I will leave other people to serve. I served, and I'm very proud of it, that I struggled so hard to clinch one of the most competitive jobs. I clinched it on merit, and I served for whatever period I did. So that's part of my history. I will leave it to other Kenyans to do it. Don't you feel that this job, because it was sort of cut short, before it was meant to have finished, there's still uh, some service to Kenyans you'd have desired to, to have, to deliver, that you did not and would now like to? No, the, the ones who are there are doing a good job. You're confident with the judiciary as it is now? Yeah, they are working. They are doing their best. I'm sure they are doing their best. 2022, will we see Nancy for president? No, not 2022. Mm. I'm still thinking about it, uh, another 10 years. So 2032 maybe, not, mm. not 27? No, no, 2032, God willing. To relax and just, you know, what, what, what are the kind of things that you do as Nancy? <laughs> I think my hands have always been so full. Um, I listen to music. I read books, mostly biographies. I, I, I don't watch movies. I watch uh, maybe documentaries. Mm. Yeah. What kind of music? What kind of music? Christian music, uh, African music. Yeah. I don't know, are you in a church choir? A long time ago. And I dance a lot, by the way. Oh, really? Oh, I dance. If a good band is coming to to Carnival, I'm the type that can go. Who are you? Who's your favorite band? Oh, do I have even a band? I just hear or a the musician. Uh, if if uh, I think the last one was when Table was alive, mm -hmm. and then there was this uh, man of K of Mali. Is it Keita? There was Keita. But I go and dance. <laughs>